Great. Are we ready? Yes, I think somebody's <laughs> nodding at me, so that's a good... It's <laughs> a good sign. Welcome, everybody. Um, uh, nice to see so many familiar faces. Friends are old and new. Uh, I'm Tim Benton. Uh, I help lead the environment and sustainability work uh, here within the Environment and Society Centre. Um, we've got... We're here to launch a report. Uh, it has been about five years in the gestation for many reasons, um, partly because it's a really interesting topic that cr cuts across a whole lot of different things. How do we use land? And in, in a sense, land has always been a strategic asset. I mean, we've had empires built upon access to land. We've fought wars over access to land. But my kind of background is in sustainable land use. Um, I really started to kind of grapple with this, moving from thinking about worrying about biodiversity and sustainable agriculture into thinking about land, following the 2007-08 food price crisis. And Sir John Beddington, who was then the chief scientific advisor, came up with the phrase, the perfect storm, that looking ahead, based on projections of population growth from 2007-08, we might need to double food production over the next 50 years. We we're already extracting 70% of the extractable water for agriculture, so we would need more water. We've got climate change that's driving more impacts, and climate change mitigation in itself, in terms of planting trees, has a land use component. So what does that do to the kind of geopolitics? If we if you just think for a minute, economic growth is broadly based on consumption growth of goods, increasingly services, but economic growth is broadly based on consumption growth. If we've got a positive GDP, positive economic growth, that means that we've got exponential consumption growth. And as Malthus pointed out a couple of hundred years ago, exponential consumption growth will end up breaking in some way, shape or form. And I think the difference now of thinking about land as a strategic asset and the difference 100 years ago is that we are reaching the planetary carrying capacity or the ability to extract ever more from land. And then what does that do to geopolitics? We have seen post-Ukraine invasion of Ukraine. We have seen Russia using food supply chains as an economic weapon or a weapon of war in some circumstances. As we look ahead, what do the rich nations do for their critical access to critical minerals, access to food security. What happens, do we end up predicating food security as the most important thing, and then we destroy nature? Just as the time when we're finding out that nature becomes really important, and if we mess up too much ecology, we end up with things like COVID. So that's the kind of topic that we're gonna talk about today. Um, what does the land crunch mean? Uh, I just want to point out, uh, pictures, well, artwork, painted by Freddie. Wave, Freddie. Freddie is a kind of artist in red residence in our group at the moment. They're painted in pollen of their kind of catchphrases that struck um, Freddie as he was um, uh, getting to gr grappling with the report. Um, and it's just an interesting notion for me, ex-entomologist amongst other things, of uh, an artist using pollen as a, as a uh, resource. So feel free to look as you go out and uh, look at Freddie's website, which is uh, over there. Um, right, housekeeping. Uh, we've had housekeeping announcements, so that's all good. Thank you very much for doing that. Uh, we've got a fantastic panel. Let me just introduce. We're going to have a 15-minute presentation by the lead author who's done really all of the heavy lifting. Over, he used to be a young lad when he came here and he's worked on the land report and looking at <laughs> heading for retirement. Richard King, Dr. Richard King. No, not Dr. Richard King. Rich, Mr. Richard King, who has been, he should be after your thesis has been published. We'll, we'll outline the report. And then we've got kind of respondents' comments from a, a, a different people. We've got uh, Rachel Waterhouse, who is team leader, Natural Resources, Climate and Environment Directorate at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. 
We have Tom Heap, who many of you will know uh, from uh, Countryside uh, and various other television programs. Uh, Countryside, Country File. My glasses are getting smeared. And Angela Francis, who's Director of Policy Solutions, uh, WWF UK. So we've got an interesting panel, government, agricultural land use, uh, civil society, and biodiversity and uh, uh, na nature. So having said that, I hope we will end up with uh, 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes for questions. But that pressure is on Richard. It's three minutes past six. So 20 past six, aim for you. Great, thank you. Yeah, so as Tim mentioned, this uh, is in relation to a report that we've launched today called The Emerging Crisis of Global Land Use. Um, but we will today focus on some of the more geopolitical questions, but just to kind of give the thesis of the report as a whole, in a nutshell, we're essentially saying that, as Tim's mentioned, humanity is facing this deepening land crunch as the demand for land, for producing food, for producing energy, for, for sequestering carbon to mitigate climate change and to support biodiversity is going to increasingly exceed the availability of appropriate land to do so. And as a consequence, we believe that this intensifying competition will make international cooperation on solutions more important, but also potentially more elusive. So I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour through the first part, and then we'll dive into some of the more geopolitical questions. Snapshot of global land use today and how we got here. I don't know how well you can see that, but we've got global land use on the left and global land cover on the right. You can divide these things up slightly differently, but essentially, in broad terms, uh, around a third of uh, around a third of global land is agricultural, around a third is forested, and around a third is other. That could, that's bare, that's mountains, that's urban. The urban is a very small percentage. Agriculture is by far and away the largest human land use um, of the forested land. A small slither of that is planted forest, but a lot of it is natural. So in terms of human appropriation of the land, the vast majority of the pressure is coming from agriculture at the moment. This is just a snapshot of global land cover change over the past 30 years or so. Um, the aggregate patterns on the right, the more dynamic breakdown of that on the left. Three key points to make here. Um, the aggregate changes, the, the net changes are masking a much more dynamic pattern. There's a lot going on that is kind of hidden by the, by the aggregate changes. The uh, most significant change is away from tree cover towards cropland. We've seen a lot of afforestation as well as deforestation, but the biodiversity value of that planted forest, a lot of that will be um, yeah, plantation. So the, the biodiversity value of that, although um, it doesn't look so significant as a net change, in aggregate, a lot, has, a lot of biodiversity value has been lost through that, through that deforestation. Just to dive into one, one particular land cover change, uh, this is uh, drivers of deforestation in recent years. All I really want to say here is this land use, land use change is a very geographical um, challenge. It's obviously, there are different drivers in different places. There's a multitude of actors involved, which just makes the policy challenges all that more difficult. It's not a, an aggregate system you can kind of solve completely top down and because it's based on land and soil qualities that are different in different places, the, what's available to different countries obviously varies um, considerably. That's where we've come from, that's where we are, where are we headed? Um, this is a chart from the IPCC 1.5 report, different scenarios of uh, land cover change that are consistent with sticking to 1.5 degrees. On the left-hand side, we've got very limited temperature overshoots. We've got shifts towards healthy and sustainable diet, di diets. In keeping to that limit, that would suggest a level of afforestation that's roughly the size of the US. On the right-hand side, we've got a, a less progressive pathway, but still within the 1.5 limit, where we see much less cooperation. We see much higher overshoot of the temperature target, and then we bring it back down through carbon sequestration. That would involve planting energy crops, um, which are almost or are around double the size of India. So whichever way you cut it, if you want to keep anywhere near climate targets in reach, 
whether you do it sustain the most sustainable option or the, or the least sustainable option, there's considerable land use change ahead in our, in our global futures. We argue that this comes down to three key pressures that are driving, um, the, what, the, driving the pressures ahead. So the first one is from climate. So that's both land-based emissions, collectively agriculture, forest, land use change account for around 20, 23, 25% of global human, land, uh, human emissions. If you include the whole food system, including the transportation and the energy, you're up to a third. You're also then seeing climate change pressures on the land, making the land less productive, um, taking land out, out of production. And then if we are going to mitigate climate, uh, climate change to any degree at all, a lot of that is going to be quite uh, land dependent. So uh, a lot of will require a lot of forest, it will require a lot of nature-based solutions, which has a, a large land footprint. So number one is climate pressures. Number two is agricultural and food pressures. So in addition to the, 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 the emissions themselves, diets, um, predominantly Western diets are becoming more pervasive globally. They're pre predominantly livestock based, very land intensive. And that is driving ec both uh, agricultural expansion and it's a driving intensification. And that's not only resulting in more land use cover change, it's also degrading the soils that are um, under production. So every year globally, we lose around the area of Malawi to degraded lands taken out of production. And the third one is energy pressures. Um, so as we change to a, or try to change towards a more net zero uh, economy, we're going to have to see a change in the energy mix. You might think that's solar arrays or that's wind farms. They are a very small land footprint. Overwhelmingly, the energy footprint comes from bioenergy and bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, which are inherent in a lot of the, the climate models to, to sort of suck carbon back out of the atmosphere. And, we, and, and that one in pink is, is sort of, the, that's the new element. So the other two have kind of been evolving. The, the energy pressure, the, the changes, the assumptions around um, the, some of the integrated assessment models as to how we can keep climate change anywhere within uh, reasonable limits. Um, that, that energy pressure is, is the new one. Um, so that's, that's what's kind of the changing the status quo. So we argue that these things, three things collectively are driving a deepening land crunch. So what is that land crunch? We, the, given the sort of uncertainties I mentioned, um, we just did a quantification of a possible future. So we took a energy model that was consistent with keeping global emissions within uh, a decent probability of two degrees scenario, uh, two degrees. And then we combine that with various food system scenarios. So one was sort of a continuation of business as usual um, out to 2050. Another version was with more sustainable agricultural production. Then we layered on top what would happen if you uh, reduced food waste. And then we layered on top of that, what if people collectively shifted towards healthier diets globally? Um, the one on the left-hand side that's, that's highlighted is the um, just the business as usual. That would in, in, imply a global agricultural footprint that increased by around 30%. If you did all of the sustainability measures, and you can argue that that's not terribly plausible, but if you did all of those things, you could actually, by mid-century, reduce the current agricultural footprint by mid-century from its current uh, level today by 11%. This just kind of picks at those two elements in a bit more detail, showing what land is assumed to change from, from what to what. On the left-hand side, that's the business as usual version. That implies that we would need more agricultural land than we have available to the tune of nearly double the size of India. If you, we look to the right-hand side and the more sustainable option, um, that would actually suggest that you could free up some agricultural land. You would have land available for afforestation to turning back into forests. Nonetheless, in either scenario, if you're keeping the energy crop element of it, so the biofuels, the new element of the energy supply mix, that would still imply using 20% of current global cropland, which relative to today is still a massive uh, you know, extraction of, of available agricultural land. If you add in the sort of forest-based component of the bioenergy mix as well, that collectively the whole bioenergy piece would be larger than Brazil's current land area. So even within that 
relatively sustainable scenario, you've still got a lot of land going to energy that is currently going to food. So I mentioned this is a geographical problem. Not every country is equally endowed with um, equal amounts of land, so how might that shake out? So we put together this index of around um, 16 indicators, and we were really trying to here to look at not just how valuable is land for agricultural production, but also what's happening to that land over time. Is it being degraded? Is it, is it improving in quality? What are the climate risks to the land? And it, crucially, how well equipped are different countries to govern that land, and what economic capacity do they have to invest in more environmental progressive measures? And we also looked at population changes. We kind of collapsed all of those different elements down through a principal component analysis. So, so this was a statistical technique that, that kind of makes the, picks out um, sort of uh, five principal components that sort of collapse down that complexity of those 16 indicators, weights them according to the data without us sort of pre presupposing different weights. And this is basically the global picture. So you can see bottom left, the continent of Africa covered, colored largely pink, uh, and large parts of South Asia. The development status there, their economic capacity, their, some of the, the government's resources are not as advanced as in other parts of the world. If you look at the one above it, the amount and quality of land, no surprise, some of the largest countries are some of the most land wealthy, but it's not purely a picture of aggregate size. Um, collapse all of that together again, and we came up with this aggregate land wealth index. I don't know how well you can see those individual scores, but some, some large uh, wealthy countries at the top, some poorer countries at the bottom, but also some, prize, some surprises. So Germany ranks much higher than its sort of size would suggest. Uh, Qatar is kind of buried down there in the bottom as a desert Arab state. A lot of the other countries around there are land are developing countries, but Qatar is much better resourced. So what does all of this mean for geopolitics and land use futures? We argue the problem is intrinsically global and political, um, but the geopolitics could in itself affect uh, land change. So we intersected our land wealth index with a consideration of countries, geopolitical and economic power typologies. And so we came, we came up with these five broad categories of countries. We, uh, we've shown some examples there. This doesn't cover all kinds of countries, but it, it looks at uh, yeah, how, how land wealth intersects with geopolitical status, with economic power. And you can see that sort of the land superpowers, they're significantly land wealthy, and they are large players on the world stage. They can exert significant influence. At the bottom end, you've got land poor developing countries, don't have a, land, a strong land score, also don't have much geopolitical influence. Um, some countries like China, you could argue, for, are not just a land superpower, but you could argue that they also fall into a threatened land wealthy category. They're, they've got a lot of resource, but they're, they're, there are a lot of water risks, etc. cetera. Um, then we considered, well, okay, we've got these typologies of countries. How might that evolve in different futures? And this matrix basically has sustainability of land use up the left-hand side and the degree of international cooperation along the right-hand side. So uh, bottom right circle is kind of business as usual um, future. Multilateralism is still sort of the guiding principle today. There's lots of... Um, you know, on the surface, there's lots of international agreement. People coming together, uh, countries coming together under different UN framework agreements, but the actual sustainability of land use is relatively poor. Um, or you could imagine top left, a future where there's much less co international cooperation, um, uh, sort of multilateralism degrades into a sort of much more unilateral um, focus, but land, the sustainability of land use might improve if countries were using their own resources within their own borders to meet their resource security concerns. The, the, the sort of very worst is the bottom left where there's low international cooperation, there's low sustainable sustainability of land use, and that may sort of degrade into the sort of real contestation around, around land use. So we considered how these different typologies might fare in these different futures, Land super, I mean, everyone is going to do better in the top right where there's high degrees of co international cooperation and 
um, high sustainability of land use. But land superpowers, if anyone's going to do well in the sort of status quo, it's going to be them. They're already kind of top of the pile. They're, they're doing okay for themselves at the moment. Potential land elites would do better in this land wealthy world where there's high degrees of international cooperation, high land use sustainability, because what's holding them back from really sort of being a player on the world stage is that actually a lot of the market structures, a lot of the regulations aren't rewarding them for the land they have. So if, if markets reoriented towards rewarding them for their, their land cover at the moment, then potentially they would do better. Uh, they perhaps don't necessarily at the moment have some of the governance capacity to deal with threats um, from international cooperation under a more um, uh, and are under a lower sustainable scenario. Threatened land wealth, e countries again would do well in land wealthy world, but uh, you could imagine them being on, at the receiving end of countries looking to appropriate their land um, in an uncooperative world, for example. Land poor geopolitical elites, these are your sort of desert Arab states, um, they are potentially going to do least well in a world which devolves into much more. Uh, potentially more sustainable in aggregate, but um, less international cooperation because they are not well landed themselves. So they may then be forced to sort of appropriate other countries' lands or would find themselves, as trade relationships broke down, they would be less able to trade and, and sort of import land resources from elsewhere. And land poor developing countries obviously do not do well in any situation, but they're probably going to do better in a world that is broadly has high degrees of international cooperation where there's international financial flows towards improving land use sustainability. So does all of this mean that there's a tragedy of commons in the making? We argue that international cooperation is essential, but the prospects for effective action are complicated by countries' political impulses and their own resource security agendas. And that means that the pressures on land may well be aggravated by countries sort of pursuing this, you know, us first approach, making conflict for land more likely and exacerbating supply constraints. So in sum, we think whatever future, there are going to be difficult trade-offs and policy decisions ahead. I will whip through some of our recommendations. I won't get into the details of these, but in sort of three broad buckets. So we argue fundamentally, we need to reduce humanity's land <laughs> footprint. Um, that includes things like transforming food systems. There's lots of notes talk around that. It's not really had the political momentum that, you know, it hasn't had that Paris moment that, that climate did. Um, the CBD potentially advanced the biodiversity agenda quite considerably last year. We've not really seen that political momentum for food systems. Uh, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage uh, will be a small part of the carbon sequestration uh, picture, but it won't be a significant part of it. We're going to have to use marginal lands better. We're going to have to decouple resource use from land through improving circularity of the economy. Second bucket is really around go glo governing global land resources much more systemically and cooperatively. So that means putting land use in the centre, thinking about land, how does land actions taken in one Rio Convention, so how do your carbon sequester, your carbon, um, your climate uh, reduction measures, how do they affect biodiversity? Think about these things through a, a land lens. Um, we're going to have to understand the land use picture globally much better. We're going to have to enforce land rights much better. Third broad bucket is yeah, seeing land differently and financing its stewardship. So how do we, through legislation, through market mechanisms, through um, finance flows, how do we sort of value land for its biodiversity, for its ecological value, for its carbon sequestration, as well as for sort of the more marketable um, productive measures. And then just finally, um, I think that the most sort of fundamental take home message from all of this is we really need to put land at the centre of all of our, these concerns. So governments in particular need to, need to make land an urgent priority. They need to at start seeing this land crunch as an existential issue. The magnitude of the challenge needs to be acknowledged. Responsibility needs to be taken for addressing it. And then that really means that land and land use is going to have to be at the center of both domestic, foreign, and economic policy. Sorry for the speed of all of that. If you'd like to read more, there's 200 more pages um, there. Um, but thank you.
so, so applause to Richard for summarising 220 pages. I mean, my boss, Bronwyn, the, the director, asked for what are the three main messages from this enormous report. And actually, every chapter in the report, in a sense, is kind of groundbreaking. And the overall picture is this one that demand for the goods from land exceed our ability to supply. And then what does that do for international relations? If China is really constrained for food security when there isn't uh, uh, a, a cooperative market, you know, in a bad year for weather or something like that, what will China's actions be? What will happen to countries that don't have access to land but have a lot of money? Will they be buying, as we're already seeing, buying big chunks of Africa to offset their carbon emissions at home. What does then that do to the global market? What does that do to indigenous people and all the rest of that? It's a really deep issue and the report is full of richness and detail. Okay, so congratulations, Richard, so you can relax a bit now. <laughs> Let's go to the panel. So a few minutes of reflections from each of you, picking on Tom first, because he's used to thinking on his feet and <laughs> digesting lots of information and spitting it out in a coherent way. Okay. Don't let me down, Tom. <laughs> well, I'll give it a go. Um, well, thanks for inviting me. Um, the, the thing that it doesn't mention on there, which is that I'm currently writing a book about land use, which I've more or less uh, come to the end of. Um, it, in fact, it perfectly complements, I is on a, although it's about land use, in a funny way, is on a completely different territory from this report here, in two ways, really, because it looks mainly at people who are making the decisions on the land, um, all the way from uh, farmers to owners of large retail warehouses who also have a lot of land under their footprint and asks about the decisions that they're making for that land. So it fits into the, the, the context of this, but it has less of a global reach. I, when I was uh, constructing it, I was arguing with myself about whether it needed to be global or domestic. In the end, it, it's kind of domestic in a global context. There are two reasons for that. One, if I thought I was writing a global book about land use, it would be uh, global in its scale. Um, and secondly, it's slightly hubristic as well to, to be writing a lot of, assuming a lot of knowledge about land use decisions made in uh, Peru or, or, or India or whatever. So I kept it more towards my expertise. Um, the, the things I would just sort of comment on by way of um, uh, sort of reaction to this. I mean, first of all, yeah, I, mean, I totally agree <laughs> with, with the premise that we're coming to a crunch. Otherwise, I, you know, that's part of the reason why I wrote the book. You know, I looked around over the last few years and land was being asked, particularly in an era of nature-based solutions, to do so many things. Uh, quite clearly, uh, to provide food, uh, to provide space for energy, to provide space for carbon storage, to provide space for water storage, housing, business, and the rest. And probably the biggest one, and one of the things that actually triggered this was the IPBES report of 2019. IPBES is the sort of equivalent for IPC, but for nature and biodiversity. And they were very, very clear that the worst thing we could do for nature is to let farming take any more bites out of natural land that is currently natural and that has a lot of implications if you're going to say that so that was the context the one thing uh, just comments i would make by way of a, a slightly different approach is that um, i'm very interested in where land can be multifunctional as well where it can do more than two things at once and there are a lot of cases of that uh, you know be it obvious things like uh, uh, solar energy alongside biodiversity, be it carbon storage alongside food production uh, done well, um, or indeed, as I mentioned, the warehouses earlier, be it commercial activity and, and, and solar panels on top of warehouses as well. There's a lot of um, possibility there, and I was also really struck by the skills of individual land managers. They have, uh, I mean, some of them don't, but the, you know, the best do, and the best have real ability to not avoid this crunch, but I'd say to a certain extent to ameliorate this crunch by being very smart with the way they use their land. And like all these things, the, the, the spread of the, the best, uh, best practice uh, more widely will be an incredibly useful thing to do. And to that end, one of the things that really gets my goat is that in recent years, the 
politics and the kind of, um, I'd even say the intelligentsia, has underplayed the skills and the importance of people who know what to do with land. It's been rather downgraded, oh, you know, you do land economy, you know, you're at the bottom of the pile, you're not a shiny digital person. People who get this stuff right will be key to solving this crunch, and we really need to respect them in in the way that we treat these kind of skills. It is incredibly important. And that's, you know, although I didn't primarily look overseas, I look, there is a case study from Kenya and there are case studies uh, from elsewhere in, in the world as well. And, you know, the smart people there are doing incredible things with their land. And just, uh, um, uh, I, I'm intrigued by, just as a sort of, uh, so someone, well, I kind of asked myself, and I, I put it to you guys as well. If land is in such short supply, why do we go around this country and see quite a lot of land that, frankly, isn't doing very much, and and, and quite a lot of European land, um, which is actually redundant in some way and has been abandoned. So this feeling that there's a land pressure that sort of I agree with, and you clearly agree with, um, if you like, academically and in policy and politics terms, isn't yet necessarily being felt on the ground. It, people look around and say, well, there's quite a lot of spare land. There's three acres over there with one horse in it. You know, what's it doing? Um, and, 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 and so I, I just kind of, I, I still think I'm slightly wrestling with myself, so I'm looking for answers. Well, we can answer that question in a while. <laughs> Rachel. A view from the Foreign Office. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, a couple of points um, first. Just so my updated uh, department is now, we're now the Energy, Climate and Environment Directorate. And I now lead what I boldly called the Sustainable Water and Food Systems Team. Very ambitiously um, of the agenda that we want to work on. Um, but having said that, I'm not here to speak on behalf of FCDO. I'm here in my personal capacity. Um, firstly, I mean, I just really want to welcome this report. It's a really um, important piece of work and brings a lot of kind of rich information and tools that we can use to highlight this agenda. Um, and and I, I, I really welcome the sort of the focus on land use because land, as you um, you know, as you point out, it is a finite resource. Um, that has quantity but also quality. And I like the way that the report delves into the qualities of land. Um, and and the, the thing is that, you know, we, we sort of recognize this academically, but out there in, in the world of geopolitics, the conversations don't play out around land use and the value of land is not accounted for and doesn't inform decision making, not in terms of quantity and even less so in terms of its, of its qualities, particularly its environmental um, qualities, which we depend on. Um, so, and I agree, I mean, obviously the, re the report is, is clear and the modeling that you've done sort of shows if we continue um, as we are doing at the moment, then yes, there's a real serious land crunch. We have, uh, we're beyond planetary boundaries and that's a pretty scary place to be in. But I think as you also um, kind of demonstrate with one of your scenarios, and um, I also like what you were saying, Tom, that yes, we, we're at a crunch point if we continue business as usual, but actually there are solutions and there are ways of getting multiple benefits from the land if we were to um, sort of address this in a different way or if we're to actually if we're to shift incentives. Um, so I think, you know, what is going to... In, in terms of the geopolitics, I don't think this um, conversation is going to play out um, particularly around how are we going to use land. It's going to play out through different conversations that have land at the heart of it, but not visibly enough. So that's why I think this report is good on focusing um, our attention on land. It's going to um, come out in kind of... It, it already is there in the sort of, you know, in, in the conversations that pitch food security and hunger against environment and conservation, that pitch cost of living and livelihoods against climate, as though these things were like opposite and mutually exclusive 
um, benefits that we're, that we're seeking to get. But actually, and again, as your report show, show, shows very clearly, these are not um, mutually exclusive. They're, if we don't sort of think about both, we'll end up with neither. Um, and that is really coming to a head, I think, as you said, Tim, because of the planetary boundaries that we're breaking. Um, uh, and, it, and it is um, you know, frustrating that vested interests kind of, I think, sort of um, exacerbates probably these arguments and there are, there, are, there are interested parties in pitching, you know, sort of food production and food security against environment and conservation as though they were separate. So I think, again, this is a really useful tool in, in, uh, uh, and sort of adds to mounting evidence and, and there's quite a lot of really um, great research and also kind of learning that is coming out from um, from other institutions as well, for example, the World Bank and IFPRI, um, some of the work that they've been doing, uh, it, as you mentioned, um, that is really kind of looking at how we actually can get multiple benefits from the land, and there, uh, there, there is experience of this. Um, I think, yeah, as we said, you know, that it's... The key challenges are there are there are there are trade-offs and there are sort of scientific challenges and technology ones, but the key ones are political. So it's how do we um, sort of go about this? Um, I think government um, policies are, are not you know they're not everything, but they are <laughs> um, sort of quite critical in shaping and driving incentives. Um, one of the issues that um, we've been working in is around um, sort of agricultural policies, including subsidies, which quite um, often have set up a series of incentives that are meant to kind of increase production and support farmers, but actually have become um, sort of probably over time increasingly um, inefficient and are actually sort of driving really harmful practices. So land use expansion, overuse of chemicals, um, and so on, as well as being extremely inefficient. So, um, you know, one of the things that, one, one of the ways of sort of trying to um, address this problem, I think, is really looking at the sort of the systemic drivers. How do we um, change policies so that we shift the incentives, both the public and private investment? Um, we've been trying to do that in some ways by convening a, a, an agricultural policy dialogue that is trying to focus on the positive experiences. So it's a different approach from, I guess, sort of conversations that have been stuck at WTO for decades, sort of saying, you know, eliminate harmful subsidies um, and, and then people dig their heels in. It's been really trying to take a different tack, saying, what are the benefits? How can we get these multiple benefits from investment in the land instead of, you know, instead of, instead of the trade-offs? Um, and, and sort of trying to identify and bring in the solutions. So I think that's the kind of approach that we need to take. I think um, COP28 will be an important moment. You said, what's the sort of the political, <laughs> um, you know, when do we get the Paris moment? It's not quite... It's not quite there, but um, it's encouraging to see that, um, you know, sort of since COP26, we started to talk about sustainable agriculture in plenary, in the non-mandated space. We started to talk much more about nature and forests. Um, and that has now, you know, with um, the UA has really sort of picked that up and um, is championing a food systems transformation campaign. I think that... Um, you know, shining that political spotlight, I think it is really important to galvanize attention and that can then, once you've got a kind of an international incentive, um, I think it can help translate through into shifting policies. Um, it's not easy to have a Paris moment for food and land use. It's so much more complex than energy transition. Um, and one of the things that we sort of still um, is, is still kind of hindering that effort, I think, is that, um, you know, we don't have a shared vision of what good looks like, um, let alone the sort of the metrics to, um, to, 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 to follow it by. And I think, you know, this report, again, can be um, sort of helpful in, in guiding us along that road. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel. Angela, last but not least on the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, I haven't read all the reports, but I'm, I am, have started reading it, and I, I now want to read the rest of it. It looks like a really uh, important and valuable piece of work, and I agree with um, Rachel's analysis that we're kind of coming at this in lots of different ways, and it's really helpful to bring it all together. I mean, as well as setting out the technical solutions, so the report sets out we need less BECs, we need less bioenergy, um, we need diet shift, we need reduction of food waste, all of things which WF strongly agrees with. It's also flagging what are the policy mechanisms we use to get there and flagging the political economy and the context we will be facing um, in order to get national policy and the international agreements. And um, I think that's really important. Um, WF is, is working on two bits of related work which I want to talk about, um, which are about how we put this land use issue on the agenda, however people come to it, the fact that we're facing this crunch and we're um, over expecting what we can do with our land at the moment. Um, and how do we drive policy that will lead to the right decisions being made? And I'm struck now, having sort of heard a bit more about the scenarios, what is the policy that gets us to that top right corner of the sustainable land use and the, and the um, international cooperation, rather than any of the other options which, uh, which are bad for most parts of the world, uh, even if a few might profit out of being there. So uh, two bits of policy that I want to mention. One is something that WF talks about in terms of a living planet bill, so something we're advocating for, which is, uh, addresses many of the bits that are talked about in the report. How do we get um, land use that gives us three critical things for life? It gives us a stable climate, it gives us um, biodiversity restoration, um, which all of our um, systems and food systems rely on, and how it gives us um, the food we need to eat um, as, a, as a planet. Um, and at the moment, what we are seeing is failure on all three counts. And as, um, as Rachel said, I would, we say the same thing. Those things aren't separate. It's not, I, I think I would challenge slightly the issue. These are trade-offs and you can choose one or the other. You get them all or you get none of them. We will not be able to choose to have food and, and compromise on climate and nature. They will all fail if they, don't, they aren't delivered together, together. And at the moment, we are, we are failing. Um, and some illustrations of where we are double county or, or misallocating our land in the UK at the moment um, in relation to our agriculture and land use emissions. We are, we are not managing to reduce them at all. They're one of the areas that um, re emissions reductions have sort of flatlined, but we're still devoting more land to feed animals, to produce biofuels, uh, than we are to feed ourselves directly. So we're, we're not challenging those, those um, big issues. Non-land-based sectors are over-relying on nature-based solutions for carbon credits to offset their emissions, so we're not mitigating as much as we should be. Some of those carbon credits are frankly not worth anything at all, and some of them are, if they're delivered well, are not, de in terms of carbon, they're not delivered well in terms of the communities that they're, um, they're, they're working alongside uh, or in the right place of land because they're offsetting and um, pushing out food production or, or nature. We're not mitigating enough, um, that's the, the main issue, but we're actually also destroying carbon sinks, so we're destroying peatlands still in the UK, and we're still depending on food supplies and um, timber pellets, which are coming from deforestation, so we are actively removing the sinks that we rely on. Um, and then the carbon credits that we, uh, the carbon sinks we create, you alluded to, Richard, uh, sometimes these huge pine forests, which are, you know, not, not going to be natural assets, and they're a desert for wildlife. So we're asking for this Living Planet Bill, which is a, which is a kind of a mechanism to ensure that government um, use our land and soils to give us the stable climate, the rich ecosystems, and the resilient supply chains that, that we need. Um, and that we manage those trade-offs so we get all of the uses, and I think multifunctional use is actually critical in that. And what we're asking for is a dedicated body. It will be something um, analogous to the Climate Change Committee that looks at how we're using our land and adds it up. Let, let's add this up. Let's, let's ask the government for a plan, and let's look at how that all adds up. And I think that takes us into a, a set of conversations around what assumptions we're making, what, what the scientific evidence is for these things. I mean, th there'll be lots of different scenarios, but let's, let's have a scenario and make sure it, we're, we're, um, we can challenge it rather than at the moment um, dealing with um, different departments having different expectations of what land is delivering and none of them making sense. And one of the really important parts of this policy, which comes to my next point, is what we're asking for is a plan in the UK that doesn't rely on us offshoring either our requirement for food 
or our expectation to restore nature or our uh, obligations on climate to somebody else. So we decide that we're going to just become a food production area and somebody else can sort out the other problems. All of those things uh, will not be acceptable, particularly if our sourcing from other countries is compromising their ability to meet the triple challenge. Everybody needs to do this together. And so that comes to the next part of this report, which I think is really useful, is the international dimension. Um, so WF is obviously a global charity. We, we are talking about a triple challenge in the UK, but we're talking about it because we think this is a, a challenge all countries face. And I think the bit that I was really interested in I said to Richard, I started geeking out in this, looking at the report, like, was, what does this mean for like, some of those conversations we've, we have about the competitive advantage? You know, what, what we've, we, have, we have ended up with certain countries producing certain things in, in terms of food and exports because they had an advantage, but that advantage wasn't predicated on you need to produce those things sustainably. It's just, you know, did you have a lot of land? So lots of places that produce enormous amounts of food do it incredibly badly. So some of our biggest agricultural exporters in the world are absolutely terrible and not doing at all the type of agriculture that we think would be the agriculture that should win in the future. So, and then we know that those countries are facing public pressure from that. So Ireland has an enormous um, meat and dairy production industry. We in the UK have got our own you know, issues with um, chicken production that's causing um, issues in rivers. Like these, these production systems are not the ones that will win out because we aren't adapted to be producing in the way we're producing. So some of those things will change where we produce, but most of it will change how we produce. Um, and I think the geopolitics of how this all reshapes itself is really challenging because how do we get from where we are now to where we want to get to when actually we have very asymmetric, asymmetric application of policy. So if the UK, which I agree is in the leading position in trying to take, take forward some agricultural policy, is doing that at the same time as having trade deals where we don't have a mechanism to say, let's import in a way that is also thinking about environmental standards, we aren't going to get there. We are still going to be supporting production in other countries. So and the, you know, as all countries move at different speeds, our trade system is not necessarily going to have the best countries win out. Some countries will find their undercut and all these issues are, are we need to be worked through. So um, I will just um, say that I think the report's enormously valuable. I think it's pointing at the right technology problems, which um, we are also very aligned with. And I think it's really helpful for us to start thinking, how do we get to scenario in the top right what policies do we need to get there, accepting that not everybody will be as motivated. We need to have some mechanisms which maybe have the progressive countries move together. And I think COP28 will be quite challenging on agriculture. It's really clean, clean to see that, uh, and happy to see that there is food systems very high on the agenda. Um, but I think your point there, Rachel, that people define what is a sustainable agriculture system wildly differently, sometimes deliberately, unhelpfully, um, and we need to be really challenging on what do we mean by that so we can make sure we're aiming for something that actually is going to be the solution that will be for thriving businesses, feed us, and, uh, and deliver our climate and nature objectives. Great. Well, as predicted, we've got about 15 minutes left for questions. Thanks very much to the panellists. Um, if you're in the room and you want to ask a question, stick your hand up. Richard, whilst people are sticking their hands up, do you want to answer Tom's question about the marginal land? The land doing nothing. Yeah. Just that. I mean, I think, yeah, that you're, you're totally right. I think part of the challenge is, is finding that land. And I think that's part of the challenge is we don't have a good enough understanding at a national level, at a global level, of what our land resources are what's degraded, what's available, what's available for multifunctionality. And so build, going to your other point about actually a lot of the land users, the landowners, they are the most knowledgeable, they know what they're doing. Absolutely. I think it's, we're just working with no, it. No, no, sure, many. Um, but it's just, there are these multitude of different actors in different places and there, it's, it's getting into some of the more policy points. The policies, the perverse incentives aren't there, the, the, whether they're technocratic, whether they're political, we're not understanding our land use and our land use risks uh, sufficiently. And we, one of the things we call for is a sort of early warning system for land. So how can we see things coming down the track, degrading land better? But on the flip side of that is also understanding, okay, there is this idle land, we can bring marginal land either back into production or if it's or restore it to its full ecological potential. It's sort of, part of it is a technocratic understanding of what land is available, 
but then we've got to layer on top of that the politi politics and the policy incentives to then use the land as some people who are closer to it understand that we should be. So, so I, yeah, a really interesting question. I, I think it's a, it's a more most evidence. It's a symptom of not that we're currently in a land crunch. It's a symptom of the fact we currently have all the misaligned policies. I mean, if we had a if we had somebody, you know, the great controller thinking about how we allocated land, we might not have that. But what we have is a set of market incentives that give us the ba bad solutions. And one of the bad solutions is you know, <laughs> marginal land. And, and we're not we're not the policy won't drive a shift. It's not that we get, we won't get to a land crunch and suddenly things will work. We'll either align our policies or we won't, and we could still have badly used land unless we fix the the policy framework. Great. We've got two questions in the room. This gentleman and this gentleman. Then I've got one online. Well, I've got several online. And then this. Ask away. Hi there. Yeah, thank you for uh, all your comments. It's just a, a quick one. So um, to what extent this might be a bit simplistic, uh, forgive me. When you talk about land competition, do you mean essentially predominantly at the soil level and above? Or do you go into detail as to below ground as well so because you mentioned like Qatar as a land poor region whereas when you talk about hydrocarbons essentially you know it's it's quite rich so um to that extent and just the second one so when you talk about land competition there the competition implies self-interest so to what extent the profit motive does decide what decisions are going to be made on on the land or beneath the land so Let's take the last one very yep. quickly. I'm not going to do the first one. But just a comment on the first one. I spoke to a farmer for the book who said, I've got loads of people offering, want, a farmer in Britain, loads of people wanted to come and use my land. Someone wants to use it for solar. Someone wants to come and use it for battery storage. Someone wants to come and use it for carbon storage. Someone wants to use it for biodiversity net gain. And the one that pays the least is the one that wants to use it for food. Yeah. Oh, and just to preface, I, I work in investment management in real estate. So that calls for changing the value of the market and the, uh, the market oh, rewards. Be more yeah. Which is yeah. an unpleasant thing to say. Richard, do you want to take the other one? Yeah, so we're looking at, um, we don't look at sort of extractive industries per se, so yeah, we are kind of talking terrestrial and above. But in terms of the shifting dynamics, I think as we decarbonise the economy, that, that means two things. So critical raw materials will become more important and they will be found in areas that are harder to reach and therefore that will open up more land for extraction. But equally, a lot of countries, like the ones I mentioned, are potentially going to be, that are currently sort of very rich in extractive industries, are going to be increasingly sat on stranded assets and their sort of existing influence, their existing economies are going to have to fundamentally restructure. So how do they think about that given their terrestrial land resource? And that will mean different things for different countries in different situations. Great. Thank you very much. And the gentleman here. Hi there. Thank you very much. Excellent reports sort of getting into pretty thorny subjects, which I'm sort of tried to get through in many years. Uh, two questions really about, did you also look at the challenge of marine and where that looks at? Because there's also other food systems and land uses and nature-based offset solutions in there. And another part of the report looking at the impact of recycling and the circular economy, because I know that's part of the European biodiversity strategy. So that takes me into the question of then legal rights, where I've seen perhaps to the question of indigenous challenges where that leaks to uh, a land ownership where you're in Africa so you have a bit of land but it's not necessarily yours it's tribal whether it's a cocoa farmer or a mining company and to the uh, Angela's point do you see a drive for more of what we've seen in Spain and New Zealand with the tr aspiring legal rights to natural things like rivers and forests oh, interesting well who wants to take that one uh, about the marine side, yeah, yeah. Uh, Richard, do you want to just deal with how the report deals with it? But I think that's a broad enough question yeah. that everybody should have a view. So, short answer is no. We are kind of terrestrially focused. Uh, that said, I think you know part of the uh, carbon sequestration picture is definitely sort of blue carbon as well. So, it, yeah, thinking about though how the some of the other nature-based solutions, which are in that sort of margin between <coughs> land, coast deep ocean might be part of the second sequestration picture, I think is important, but the report as a whole, no, focuses more on terrestrial resources. Um, and the circular economy thing and the, the land rights, yeah, incredibly important. I think particularly as sort of we 
transition from sort of more extractive industries and we look for sort of bio alternatives for plastics for oil-based products that increasing uh, focus of the circular economy will yeah, ex absolutely make land rights indigenous land rights land ownership uh, informal land tenure agreements all the more important to sort of bring those people both to protect them and to bring them into the decision making table so that they're not excluded from the conversation and so they are able to benefit from uh, the, the use of their lands, which they have a claim on. Angela, do you want to just chip in? Yeah, I was going to mention marine as well, because I think it's a, you don't have to necessarily include it in your study, but you need to have some parameters which connect you. So what food, how much food do you need? It relates to how much um, seafood you're eating, how much um, you expect your land to uh, absorb carbon relates to how much you're expecting the sea to continue to absorb. Similarly, where your nature, if you're dealing with biodiversity, a large proportion of biodiversity is in the water um, and how you manage um, many of the climate projects we will, will, will be related to you know, deep sea mining and offshore wind and all those kind of things. So yeah, de definitely deeply connected. Um, in our Living Planet Bill, we, we are talking about um, having both um, a consideration for land and sea. Um, I think people feel the land crunch or they feel it more pertinently, but you can't answer the question. I think uh, for, for us, particularly when it comes to the biggest part of this is, is the food system. And I think the food system approach is absolutely crucial. Like you don't answer any of these questions unless you change the food system. And our work on, um, on diet shift includes much more sustainable seafood. Um, and how how we how we farm how we fish that and how we reward the fishers and how we wor work with communities who have fish as a significant part of their diet is a very very big part of that. Um, I can just say one one sentence on indigenous communities, which re reinforces what Richard says. There's a couple of like no regrets actions we think you need to take to deliver on all elements of that, and, and one of them is giving um, making sure you have governance systems and indigenous rights community rights for. 30% of, of the land that we think needs to stay in in sort of you know um, wild state and that's uh, that's important in managing those lands because they are the best governors of those lands I think it also comes into having uh, it, where we value nature ensuring that there are systems to make sure that that value goes to the community so they're rewarded properly because that, that that isn't happening um, very well at all at the moment Rachel Thanks. I just wanted actually to come back to Tom's point about um, investment in land and what you get, <laughs> what the incentives are. And I think that's one of the things that makes it so complicated. I, I, I mean, it's just very telling in terms of how we value land or don't. Um, the fact that for that f for farmers, they're getting some of the lowest rewards, but that doesn't mean that necessarily um, food should be. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that the, the, the problem of cost is with the farmer. I think it's, it's a whole question of the system and what happens at, by the time it gets to the supermarkets. And, and then again, it sort of comes to that sort of, you know, that sort of um, trade-off that is so-called trade-off that um, benefits some uh, interests and stakeholders more to cast it that way than others to sort of pitch it as a sort of cost of living versus the environment. So I think there's a whole, you know, it, it, it is really important to look at it from that sort of systems point of view. And it's not just about what the farmer does, but what's happening on the consumer side. And I think, uh, I mean, there was the interesting report on true cost accounting of the food system published by the FAO last week that showed that the external costs, the hidden costs from the food system were over $12 trillion, greater than 10% of GDP, mainly two thirds of which were driven by health costs of poor diets and the other third effectively, or the other 25% by environmental costs that we're talking about. So were we to price in the externalities, then that has a significant implication for food it has a significant, food prices, it has a significant implication for waste, but it obviously has an issue to do with access to food and food insecurity and marginalised populations and so on. So all of these things are really deeply interconnected. Now, we have time for probably one more question. And uh, uh, I'm afraid it's got to be a woman. <laughs> we've, had, we've had lots of questions. <laughs> Uh, for men, most of the questions on online are for, for men. Let's try sneaking in two women and then we've had a completely balanced set. 
Thank you. Very happy I'll, to volunteer. I'll be sacked if, I, if we get agenda. <laughs> I'm well. very happy to Sorry, volunteer. Uh, thank you to Richard and your colleagues for a great report and interesting comments from all of the panel. It's a very quick question for each of the panelists. This is a very concerning picture. Where do you look to for optimism for the future? And this lady at the front as well for the final. It's kind of similar. Um, but I was interested in um, Tom's examples of multifunction tracts of land, and I was wondering if there were particular nations or regions that were similarly, similarly forward thinking that you think is getting, that they're getting it right, that we should look to as role models. Great. Tom, do you want to tackle yeah, that I, one? I, I'm sorry to ask your, your question. I don't know of whole nations that are getting this right o overall. Um, with, with multifunctions, uh, but yeah, I, I think there are a lot of individuals uh, who, who are doing it, and to some extent the, the, the policy here is trying to be multifunctional, but with a really big caveat that they, a lot of the pol agricultural policies here are offshoring um, quite often food production, actually, to somewhere else, and they haven't fully thought through the environmental impact of that. Um, sources of optimism. Uh, science gives me quite a lot of sources for optimism in two ways. I think there are very interesting things happening in, 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 in crop science, which will help both, I mean, in a whole bunch, you know, crop science the last 50, 100 years has been all about productivity, largely about in a, in a chemically enhanced world. There are some now really interesting things happening that are going, you know, that are uh, um, engaging science for a more uh, renewable um, and, and uh, sustainable future. There's really interesting things happening there, both in crops and in fertilizer as well. Really interesting work happening, a lot of it in the circular economy. I mean, fertilizer always was based on waste and in many ways can be based on waste in, in, in a more sophisticated way. And I'm just going to say, because I think it's probably we're getting to sum up time, I just wanted to amplify. Uh, and uh, probably exaggerate one part of the report. Um, biofuels are a terrible idea. They yeah. really are a terrible idea. Um, they're incredibly inefficient in terms of land use. If you want to make energy from land, put solar panels on it. Uh, you can do a lot with that energy and you can do a lot with the land around uh, those, those panels. And, you know, I think, uh, and then on, on to Bex as well. I mean, it's so unproven and also, um, where carbon capture and storage does work, and actually I'm quite in favour of carbon capture and storage in some areas, it's where you've got very concentrated sources of carbon dioxide, not where you've got incredibly widespread fields that cost a lot to transport because wood isn't particularly energy dense anyway. So I think it is, uh, it's a problem for land use and it's a problem for climate change. Great. Well, thanks very much, Tom. <laughs> Angela, sources of optimism. Sources of optimism. Yeah, yes. It, I, I am always optimistic because otherwise you couldn't be in this in this in this uh, kind of career without being optimistic. When I think when I look at what's happening in, far, for, in farming, I feel optimistic. It's not universal, but there are pockets of um, genius happening where people are figuring out how to farm in a way that combines energy and, and it and it works for their um, their livelihood. It gives them more security. Think. And one of the things I think is really inspiring or or. Um, making me makes me feel confident is these things these things work globally and so it's really a really um good method for giving good incomes for developing country farmers as well so ha as soon as we can get to um making that, those kind of systems more mainstream um getting farmers to have reduced their input use on expensive fossil fuel fertilizers have a more secure income have a more diverse set of products i think um the, you know the better they i think once they see this as a solution for them we'll we'll be moving things much more quickly Rachel. Uh, yeah, maybe for the wrong reasons, but I do feel that there's there's increasing sort of awareness and attention both across governments and private sector and and other organisations that I think a lot of um, stakeholders are really waking up to the issues and um, it's I'm in a privileged position to um, be able to see some of the good um, sort of practices and things that are working kind of coming through and sort of seeing those shared is is really encouraging. Um, I mean, just one tiny little example for ex um, that we've heard from Brazil about some of the work that they're doing on um, natural fertilizers and how that's, um, you know, helped them save money on imports, but also increase productivity. So, you know, it's just like you do get the examples where it is possible to deliver 
um, sort of multiple benefits from from land if it's done in in the right way. And I think um, you know I'm really encouraged to see this come up the agenda in the sort of climate space where nobody was talking about um, sort of land and. Um, food really at all so it's um, maybe for the wrong reasons but it's good that the conversation is there and that the solutions are coming through. Great. Richard you've sweated blood sweat tears and everything else over the last few years where are your sources of optimism? Um, I, from a technocratic point of view I don't this isn't an unsolvable problem a lot of the answers are already out there it's just now a question of doing it and but doing it is not just a technocratic issue, it's also a political issue. So optimism in terms of the solutions are out there. As Rachel says, I think from a policy point of view, these issues are creeping onto the table. At the margins, they're not in the centre of the piece of the table at the moment, but they're at least kind of being discussed in right fora. And I think just purely in the climate space, but sort of the renewed um, agreement between the US and China to work together on climate change despite all of their geopolitical tensions in other fora suggests that actually if we do understand the magnitude of the problem and we can kind of align uh, incentives in the right way then actually maybe there is, there is space to talk so if we can kind of extend that get this issue sufficiently high up the agenda extend that to other nations then perhaps we'll start to see the policy levers that enable the sort of more technocratic solutions to follow. Great. Well, I couldn't sum up any better than Richard's just summed up. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, apologies to everybody who wanted to ask a question, and there are quite a few online that I haven't been able to get round to. Uh, thank you to everybody. Thanks to Angela, to Tom, to Rachel for being asked to read a 220-page report in 24 hours and then be cogent about it. And thanks most of all to Richard for doing all the hard miles and getting this report over the line. And, of course, thanks to everybody here all the staff for helping put this together. Thank you.